I work at a company called KDAP. We do consulting for everything related to Qt. And one thing we do multiple times is that customers approach us about performance problems in their Qt Quick applications or Qt Widget applications. And since that is something I've seen quite a lot of time, quite lots of times, I want to tell a bit about performance and how to approach analyzing and fixing performance of your Qt Quick applications. And when we talk about performance, there are actually multiple aspects of performance. One could be startup time. Uh, for example, if you have an embedded device that the user turns off and on quite often, then boot time and startup time matters. Even on the desktop, startup time is important because if your application takes five seconds to load, that simply makes a bad impression. Other aspects of performance would be the frame rate, how smooth your application is. Or as Gunnar says, you need to have velvet animations that run at 60 frames per second. Um, then we have other aspects as, as memory usage could be important if you have a constrained device, multiple applications running, you're not allowed to take too much memory. Then you might have um, power usage is important for mobile phones, of course boot, and responsiveness. With responsiveness, I mean if you press a button, how long does your UI take to react? Since all that is much too much to cover in one talk, I'll focus on two aspects. That is startup time and uh, rendering performance velvet animations with 60 frames per second. Um, for that, I'll have two examples, uh, and we'll start with the first one. And we'll start with startup time. So startup time as a C++ programmer, so all my applications are usually well, are hybrid applications, C++ and Qt Quick. And as a C++ programmer, the first thing when your application is slow or starts up slow, the first thing you should do is take out your C++ profiler and have a look what happens at startup. Um, so I've done this on this example. One of the bars blacked out because it would reveal too much about the project, which I'm not allowed to talk about. Um, now this is a, just a normal C++ Qt Quick Hybrid application, and the profiler I'm using is VTune. So, so I'm a Linux person. There are unfortunately not that many good performance tools available. VTune is one of them. Then we have CacheGrint, which is a Velcrint plugin. Then we have Perf on modern Linux systems. On the desktop, I quite like VTune. Uh, it's not free for commercial projects. It costs money. Uh, but if you're an open source developer, for example, in the KDE community, I can highly recommend trying out VTune. Anyway, so this is the application. Um, one thing we see here, main calls a lot of different things. And we can see it, some things take, take quite a lot of time. And there are two approaches to that. You can look into that and try to optimize the, like break it further down and do some micro-optimizations. But the best thing to fix performance in C++ code is to call less C++ code. For example, imagine you are developing in-vehicle navigation system, and that has voice commands that tell you to turn left and turn right and make an illegal U-turn and so on. These voice commands, you need to load the voice packs from disk, and that takes time. But why do it at startup? That would be a typical example of things that can be delayed until later. Or the fonts here. Do we really need to load all the 100 different fonts the font designer gave us, or are we actually just using three or four? So best way to actually reduce the things happening at startup as much as we can. So that might fix the font. Maybe we can delay the initialization of storage and so on. Um, but the big elephant is in the room is this Qt Quick set source, the Qt Quick view. When the Qt Quick View loads the QML file, in this example, it takes most of the time. And people who have no idea about the QML engine internals, it's just black magic what's happening there. We cannot really see what's going on and how to make things faster by looking at a C++ profiler here. Even people who know the QML engine internals, they might know what these functions will do, but what components I actually loaded and what actually happens can only know by looking at the data structures and not by looking at the profiler. And 
before I want to go into the QML profiler, which is a higher level tool, since C++ profile is clearly too low level to analyze the Qt quick part of that scene, I want to talk a bit about the profiler, uh, the C++ profilers. For every tool, you need to be aware how your tool works and what your tool measures. That's quite important. For example, if you profile with Velcrint, you need to be aware that it counts instructions. So Velcrint, for example, will not show you if you spend time uh, loading a file from disk, which on embedded systems with slow flash memory can take a lot of time. Velcrint will not show you when you have a sleep in your application. Believe it or not, I had one customer project that had a sleep 200 uh, in the main startup phase to fix some race con condition with some IPC initialization. Profiling tools like Velcrint wouldn't find that. Same is true for perf. You need to know if you use perf how it actually works. You need to understand. So please, if you use any tool, read the manual. If you don't understand how your tool works, you are unable to understand the output of your tool. So perf, for example, uses the performance measurement unit of your processor and triggers collection of performance data when some counter overflows, which is, again, the cycle counter so you won't see idle time or sleep time like I.O. or sleeping. Um, even VTune has two different modes, but fortunately it has a mode that also can see idle time and sleep time. Um, so know your tools, know what they do, know how to interpret their output, read their manual. The other important thing is only attempt profiling in release mode. It makes a big difference. If your application or your queue is built in debug mode, your result will be completely off. Um, so try to get a release build with debug information. So the tools need to get debug information to actually get a proper backtrace. But do a release with debug information build of your application and of Qt. If you are, if you are developing for embedded, uh, most developers developing for embedded also can run the application on the desktop, which usually has better tooling, much nicer debugging. Uh, but for actual profiling, do profile on the device that behaves completely differently most of the time. And finally, when you profile startup time, you need to use cold caches. So uh, on Linux, you can, there's a command, you can drop the caches, so then when you load a file, it needs to actually access the disk again to simulate normal startup. Um, Anyway, we've seen this big block of QML code, which we can't optimize or we can't look into further. And we've seen the C++ part, which we might be able to optimize. But a big chunk of Qt Quick internals, we need a better tool. That, of course, is the QML profiler. Ulf Hermann, after my talk, has a talk about the QML profiler. He'll tell a bit more details about that. So I'll quickly show you the most important details. These Three rows here are only available in the enterprise profiler. So if you've got the Qt enterprise version, not the LTPL version, uh, you have three additional rows, which might come in useful. And Henny, yeah? With enterprise, you mean the professional or only the enterprise version? Because there's a difference between professional and enterprise. Uh, sorry, I'm not completely up to date with, with all the different license versions, but some of the enterprise, commercial, whatever versions will have these three rows, yeah? Ah, okay. So the indie version doesn't have it, but the professional and the enterprise version. Um, anyway, important buttons is this button here, you can profile on a remote device. So if you do use the QML profiler and I and have an embedded project, do switch this from QML profiler local to QML profiler remote, and you can connect to your remote device. Use this button where you can start and stop collecting. Only measure what you actually want to measure, not like all 60 minutes of your program execution, because then you have a giant data dump, which is both slow for the computer to process, and it will simply be too much for you. Um, and even if you have too much data, you can break down uh, on the timeline. You can zoom to the area of interest. Anyway, so on the same application I've shown you, Oh, two more things before I come to that. Use Qt 5.4 and use at least Qt Creator 3.2. The developers of Qt Creator and Qt have made tremendous improvements in the QML profiler. The new versions are just much better and have more features. So do try that with a new version. So let's 
do that in our application and let's have a look at the result. Um, you see four different phases here. And again, you need to understand how your tool works, what it measures, and what the meaning of that is before you are able to interpret the results. Um, we see two different, four different phases here. The first one is the compiling phase. Means simply, it takes your file like a button.qml and compiles your file, which only needs to be done once for each QML file. Of course, it needs to be do that at the very first thing because without compiling QML file, you can't use it. So that's the first phase. Second phase is instantiating or creating the objects in the QML file. <coughs> so here, it loads my main.qml file. My main.qml file might load a settings.qml file and a dashboard.qml file, which would then get a second row. Then the dashboard.qml might load a clock.qml, which would be in the third row, and so on and so on. So your main QML file gets broken down in many, many different QML files. They're all loaded and created here. After the objects have been created, the bindings are assigned, um, which means the QML engine will evaluate all JavaScript bindings and assign that to the properties of the queued objects. So far, these three steps completely make sense. But what the hell is this long fourth phase shown here? I mean, this thing loaded my main.qml file. Shouldn't it be done after that? What's this thing? And for me, that was quite surprising uh, until I think it's even mentioned in documentation. Um, after the three phases are done, there's a so-called completion phase. I don't know. You guys might know the component.oncompleted handler in JavaScript. No? Yeah, some people know the component.oncompleted handler in JavaScript. There's a similar thing in C++. It's called, uh, I think, com component complete. It's a virtual function, many items override. And these functions are called after the bindings are assigned. For example, in the completion phase of, the, of an image, the image is actually loaded. If you load an image, um, uh, only after loading the image, the width and the height are known, which means some bindings might change, which, which you see here, right? Some of the completion handlers load images that changes properties and causes property binding re-evaluations. Re um, other thing is, when a text item is completed, it does text layouting. And when a list view is completed, it instantiates its delegate. When a repeater is completed, it instantiates its delegates too. Uh, the list view and repeater cases you see here. So now we know what's going on. This big giant thing here, the fourth phase is the completion phase. Um, and when you hover over the tooltips, will show me it takes a lot of time to complete the text items. But at this time, we hit the limit of the QML profiler um, because we can't break that further. Why does creating or completing a text item take so long? We need again to look into the C++ code and the C++ profiler to figure out what it's doing. But now that we know what, that this is the completion phase, we know what to look for, which is the component complete function. So this is again VTune. It shows that the, compl that the component complete of the Qt quick text takes a long time. That is what we've seen in the QML profiler. But the C++ profiler is able to break that further down and we can see what actually happens. And that is something in QFont config database taking a long time. And uh, to even further break that down, this was in this example of this application, uh, a call to some font config thing was unable to break it further down, but it gave me the right idea. I looked how many fonts I have in my system. Um, might not be very well readable. I simply call FC list which lists all font config registered fonts. And I have 2,900 fonts on my system, which is a lot. Um, so just for fun, I tried to disable all fonts. In my application, I didn't need fonts. I load custom fonts from a designer anyway. So I disabled all my system fonts, which made all applications just draw rectangles instead of letters, but that didn't, didn't matter. The result was 700 milliseconds of speed improvement. Um, and that is just an example of, at some point you get to the limit of the QML profile, you need to go down into the C++ layer again to further analyze the result. Uh, 
By the way, getting back my system fonts was kind of a challenge because I used a text editor to edit the font config file. I wanted to edit it, it back, but my text editor only showed rectangles and not real fonts. So it was kind of hard editing the file with just seeing rectangles, but somehow I managed. Um, so this is one phase, the completion phase. Again, we have two choices. You can look into the details like I just did here, but the best way to improve the speed of the completion phase is to have less items to complete. Okay, let's look at the next, or actually the first phase. Remember, in the QML profile, we've seen four phases. This was the first phase, compilation, where it compiles my button.qml, my main.qml, and all my other QML files. This phase usually is quite quick to do, like this was 30 milliseconds, it didn't really matter. Um, but a colleague of mine told me on some mobile device, his compilation phase actually took two seconds, so it might matter for you. And the best way to improve the performance of the um, compiling phase is to have less items to compile. But if you can't do that, of course you can still improve. Um, one way, to improve the compilation phases used to use the Qt Quick Pro, uh, the Qt Quick compiler, which is available in enterprise and maybe professional. Again, I don't know the complete license terms. Um, because the Qt Quick compiler compiles the QML files ahead of time instead of just in time, um, which in theory would remove the complete compilation phase, but in practice removes about 50% of it. Uh, they are compiled ahead of time, but they still need to be loaded and registered when the application runs, so the compilation phase is not completely gone when you use the Qt Quick Profiler. So mostly the compilation phase is not a problem, but if you've got an enterprise license anyway, uh, why not use the Qt Quick Compiler to improve startup a little bit? Next phase, the binding phase. You know what the best way to improve the speed of bindings is? you have less bindings, correct. So the best way to improve that, remove bindings or don't load as many items with so many bindings. But if you have to, if you have to have many bindings, keep your bindings simple. And if your bindings get complex, move the binding code to C++ because multi-line JavaScript bindings are not maintainable anyway and C++ is faster. Um, and again, the Qt Quick compiler helps here actually. Um, the Qt Quick compiler actually improves the performance of your JavaScript code. Um, the reason for that is what, the, what normally happens when JavaScript is compiled. Um, so the compiler, just-in-time compiler, creates an abstract syntax tree. From that, it creates an intermediate representation, which gets optimized a bit. And from that, it creates machine code. What the Qt Quick compiler does is does the same, it creates an abstract syntax tree and an intermediate representation, but instead of creating machine code, it actually creates C++ source code. That C++ source code then is uh, run through GCC, and GCC is much, much better than optimization and generating machine code than the just-in-time compiler and the V4 engine is. That is the reason why the Qt Quick compiler actually improves speed of JavaScript execution, because it uses the GCC optimizer. Um, and I got curious, I have a very real-world use case here, the very real-world benchmark. That's, by the way, why you should never trust benchmarks. They are mostly not real-world. Uh, so I have some function, and I was just curious how much the speed improvement would be. Um, if I just run that a bit normal Qt Quick, that takes one second to execute. With the Qt Quick compiler in release mode, uh, I get a speed improvement of 50%, which is quite nice. With the Qt Quick Compiler and Debug Mode, it runs five times slower, which again highlights the point that you should always profile in Release Mode and never in Debug Mode. And of course, the best way to improve the execution time of JavaScript code is have less JavaScript code. Or in this case, do it in C++ instead, which is even 10 times faster than the Qt Quick Compiler. Uh, of course, my use case for JavaScript there was a big function, wasn't a real world binding. For normal bindings, maybe the, the performance overhead is a lot less. How much it is, I don't know. I did one simple test that one simple test did 15%. Uh, I don't know what the average number of speed improvement there is. Um, 
Let's go to the next phase, creating. The best way to improve the creating phase time is to have less items to create. Um, and you can't, but if you are stuck with your items, you can't improve much there. If you have custom items that are created by the QML engine, uh, make sure your constructor isn't terribly slow, but apart from that, you can't do much here. So to sum up at startup, to speed up startup, have less things to do, and the best way to do that is use a loader to load things on demand later instead of loading them all at startup. And that's all I have to say about startup phase. Uh, we've seen that we can use the QML profiler, but we've also seen that in, at some points we need to go down to the C++ level again um, to, to really get a more detailed view of the results here. So the second topic I want to talk about is rendering performance, frames per second, velvet animations, iPhone-like animations, whatever you call it. Um, and let's take scrolling of a list view as an example. Let's say you have a list view, you scroll the list view, and you see it's not 60 frames per second. What might be wrong? And before you look at the rendering, most of the time it's not actually rendering that is slow. Uh, before you look at the rendering, look at other aspects. You might be on a multi-process system where another process is taking a lot of CPU. For example, one embedded project I'm working on right now uses 10 to 15% of CPU permanently for some IPC communication. So, or other threats you might have in your application. Uh, so make sure the CPU usage of those other threats and processes don't impact your performance. Um, you might have some timers. That actually happened in, in one of our projects. We had a timer running in the background which fired every 50 or 100 milliseconds and that then did some work. And as a result, scrolling was very jerky and jumped around. So that might be a reason. Timers might be in C++ or JavaScript, so use the QML profiler or use a tool like Gamma Ray to have a look, look at the timers. Multiple ways to find out your timers that are running. Um, Another thing to keep in mind, in list views, when you scroll list views, in QML list views, it creates a lot of delegates. So the actual items in the list views are created on demand. That might be slow too, but you'll see that in the QML profiler, you see the creating phase, uh, and you can see that there. Um, one thing I usually do is I simply put a rectangle in my scene and make the rectangle rotate uh, with an animation um, that way I can test the rendering performance without, for example, list view scrolling where other things might impact the scene. So I can just see if the rectangle rotates uh, smoothly enough. But anyway, so before you actually look at rendering performance, make sure it's not other aspects playing uh, into your measurements. Once you've done that, it is time to actually look at rendering performance once you've fixed these issues. Um, there is in the Qt help is a great documentation page that explains a bit how the scene graph renderer works and what you can do to improve scene graph rendering. One important aspect is batching. Uh, I will not go into detail of that. Please read that documentation. Uh, there are lots of useful little tips uh, to improve your rendering performance there. So that's useful to read. Um, but I'll ask you, what is the best way to improve render performance? Yeah, you render less items, that's correct. And one thing or one tool you can use is this environment variable, QS3 Visualize, uh, to find out how much is actually rendered. Um, this is a simple application which simply displays some rectangles uh, running with QS3 Visualize equals overdraw, and it shows you how much is actually rendered. Uh, the blue box is the bounding box of your screen, and you see this thing here, the little button out of screen, it's not shown on screen, but it's still rendered. And that's because the cute quick scene graph renderer doesn't do any um, occlusion culling, it doesn't do any viewport clipping, it simply blindly um, sends all drawing commands to the GPU of all visible items. That means you need to take care that items which are out of screen have the visible property set to false, because otherwise, 
the scene craft renderer will send all drawing commands of all items to the GPU. Like a typical situation application might be, you have a home screen which you can swipe, then it moves to a different page, and usually people forget to set that one page to invisible once it's out of screen. That's then a complete full screen page which gets rendered, and only in some late stage uh, after all the viewport transformation, the GPU will notice, oh hey, I don't actually need to render this, and then throws it away. If you set visible to false, it will throw away things much earlier. Again, know your tools, know how your stuff works, read the documentation. Um, I admit I didn't for a long time, uh, but this is actually mentioned in the documentation that there's no occlusion culling uh, or viewport clipping. Um, but once you've done the, all that, you follow the performance tips uh, from the help. You looked uh, at, at the overdraw and saw, okay, I'm not actually render rendering unnecessary items and your rendering is still slow, then you might have a look at what actually happens during rendering. There are two ways uh, to do that. If you have the Qt Creator Enterprise version, uh, it will display that in the QML profiler. <laughs> if you don't have the Enterprise version, set the environment variable QST render timing. Might be a bit hard to read, but this information is basically the same as here. Um, of course, the Visualization QML profile is a bit more useful because it, uh, it puts it in relation of the other events in your timeline instead of being a big list of scrolling text output. But both show the same information. Make sure you use a threaded renderer loop um, because for some reason this information is only available on the threaded render loop and not the basic render loop, so you might need to set that environment variable just for profiling. Um, and the big thing to be aware of, these timings you see here are times on the CPU. They are not GPU times, they are times the CPU spends doing stuff. Um, let's keep that in mind and have a look at the two different things here. We have the, our UI thread, which is the main thread, and we have the renderer thread, and both do things. And again, we need to understand our tools, what they measure and how they work. So I'll quickly explain what all these numbers are and what these measurements mean. So let's start with the GUI thread. One of the things is the polish phase. Uh, yeah, it's indeed not very readable here, but the polish phase is here. In my example, it takes zero seconds, zero milliseconds to execute. Uh, basically, polishing means each item like makes itself ready for presenting, like it polishes itself and straightens itself out, makes themselves ready for presentation. One item might be a quick text item, might do some last minute text layouting. Um, and what I had at one customer was the polishing phase was taking a long time. And the, of course, when you see this, you just see polishing takes a lot of time, but why? then you need to fall back again one level deeper and look at your CPU C++ profiler. Um, because we know what the polishing phase is, it's basically just the virtual method update polish. So we had a look at the update polish invocation and it turns out that in one mode, the canvas in Qt Quick uh, does all its rendering in the polish phase. And then we start simply figured out, oh yeah, we have too many canvases doing too complex stuff. That shows up here in the rendering in the polish phase. Then we have the animation phase, which is usually just advancing animations. Not much happens, but you might get some binding updates triggered by that. So pay attention to that. Um, and once the GUI thread like, has finished that, it has polished all items, it has advanced the animations, then the GUI thread tells the render thread, hey, render thread, I'm done, please render me. Then it needs for the, then the render thread goes and grabs the scene graph items from the UI thread and copies them to the render thread. Um, because of multi-threading, the main UI thread needs to wait until the synchronization of the scene graph is complete. And that is the block and sync phase. So in here, the GUI thread waits for the render thread to complete its synchronization of the scene graph items. Um, 
And what we see here in the GUI thread, or which you might not see if you sit there in the last row, is uh, even even I have a hard time reading this. Um, this is this here, sync takes 100 milliseconds to execute. So we know that, now we understand our tools, now we understand what the program actually doing, we know, okay, our GUI thread is simply waiting for the render thread. So if you go back here, yeah, it takes a long time, but it's not actually doing something, it's just waiting for the render thread. So what we need to look at in this example is the render thread. Um, so let's have a look at the render thread. Again, there are lots of or four or five different variables. Uh, frame delta is simply uh, the inverse of the frames per second. Sync is the time it actually takes to copy the scene graph items from the main thread to the render thread. And what the render thread does is basically calls the update paint node method and then copies over the scene graph items that method returns. So again, if in the render thread the sync phase is slow, you need to go down one level, invoke your C++ profiler, and figure out why that is the case. You might have some custom item which has a very slow update paint node method. Usually it's not this phase being slow, but if it is, you now know what's actually going on, you now understand the tool output, and you can debug that further. Um, then we have two things, which is the first render, which is the actual rendering time. So first render is the time the scene graph renderer takes to iterate over the scene graph tree and uh, call the drawing commands and send the drawing commands to the GPU. So first render is basically time it spends iterating over the scene graph and calling OpenGL methods. And then final swap is the time it takes, so after all the drawing is complete, it calls GL swap to wait for the frame buffers to be swapped. Um, and there's one caveat here in these two values. These can be very confusing. Normally what you see, first render is quite fast. It simply sends the, the drawing commands to the GPU and does nothing else. And then final swap takes a long time. Final swap, first of all, you'll never see that being quicker than 16 milliseconds, uh, because that's the the, um, the amount of time uh, one swap takes at least if you run with 60 hertz. That's the vsync period, so it needs to wait 16 milliseconds to wait for the new v for the next v plank. Um, so the final swap will take some time, and if you're really slow rendering, like if you have tons of GPU drawing commands and the GPU is sweating and, and taking a lot of time, then the final swap will take a lot of time. So if the GPU is busy, uh, this will actually take longer than 16 milliseconds. So if you see swap being slow, it's the GPU being slow. All the other phases we talked about is CPU, like, like remember the sync, it's not running anything on the GPU, it's actually just a call to update paint node of all items. That's running on the CPU. But if the swap is slower than 16 milliseconds, it is the GPU being slow. With one important and confusing caveat, depending on your driver, depending on your driver, um, the GPU will not block in the swap and wait until all commands are executed in the swap command, but it will do so on the next render command, which usually happens to be GL clear of the next frame. In that case, the render time might actually be slow, because then GL clear, like the first render command you issue, that will block and wait for the frame to be completed. At least that is the case on the driver I have running on my laptop. So. Usually, final swap, if that is slow, it might be the GPU taking a long of time, but it can also be the first render, depending on your driver, because then the next OpenGL command, that will block until the last frame is completed. So keep that in mind, otherwise it might be confusing. Um, yeah, Remember in presentations, always disable power management. Here we go again. Um, so if you have a look on the here again, because that is something you can see. 
uh, we, see, we see in this case swap is actually slow. Swap is slow, so we know for sure, yeah, it's actually GPU commands being slow. The graphics card is taking a lot of time to process the commands you send the graphics card. Um, and actually, in the example here, it's different. Um, here, first render takes a long time, but that is just because of the caveat I told you that the first OpenGL command of the next frame might block instead of the swap. Um, there is also a way to break down this render time more. Uh, you see that here it says breakdown of render time, and it has different phases like pre-process, update, binding. And to be completely honest, I told you to understand your tools and understand what they measure, but this one I don't understand because I have never looked into the details of the scene graph in much detail, so I don't know how the scene graph works in detail, so I cannot personally interpret these values. But it might sometimes be useful. If your first render time is slow, it might actually be something the scene graph renderer does. In that case, the breakdown of render time might help you. But in my example, it clearly was GPU taking too long. And again, we need a different tool. We need to look into the details. The QML profiler won't give us the details. A C++ profiler won't give us the details since the C++ profiler measures CPU time. So we need to find a different tool. And one nice tool for that is API trace. API trace is a call which basically intercepts all OpenGL calls and measures how long they take both on the CPU and on the GPU. So I've put this scene through API trace. It's available on embedded devices as well. It's a very useful tool. Um, here you have a row how much, how long the commands took to execute on the CPU, and here how long the same commands took to execute on the GPU. And as you can see, the GL clear took a long time, but that's only because of the caveat I told you first OpenGL drawing command of the next frame. This is actually waiting for the GPU to complete. On the CPU, all OpenGL commands are usually fast because all it does is it, it sends the command to the GPU so it doesn't spend much time on the CPU there. On the GPU, on the other hand, we'll notice we have one GL draw elements call which takes a very, very long time. Um, See here, it takes 55 milliseconds on the GPU to execute. That is clearly much too slow. And the nice thing about API trace is it has a replay command. So it records all OpenGL commands and gives you the ability to replay your OpenGL commands. And when you replay your OpenGL commands, it can profile them and it knows the state, the OpenGL state at each point, at each method invocation. Um, and it, once you've done that, the replay, you can double click any, any call here and you'll get details of that call. So here we have all OpenGL calls, the scene graph renderer issued for one frame. And this is the GL draw elements call that was slow in our case. I can examine all the details here and I can examine the OpenGL state. One aspect of the OpenGL state is the shader. And here we notice I had a completely inefficient shader, a completely inefficient pixel shader. No wonder that's taking a long time. That might, for example, be, you know, the shader effect element in Qt Quick that allows you to write custom pixel shaders, which gives you nice effects, but of course might cost you some time. This is, of course, a completely hypothetical example. It's not a ex shader that has actual work besides doing a long loop, um, but it shows, again, in your QML profiler, if that doesn't get you far enough, go into the details with a C++ profiler or with tools like API trace to figure out more details. So in this case, you might remove the shader effect or write a more efficient shader effect or something like that. That said, usually the looking at the open GL commands won't get you far unless you understand the scene graph renderer and are willing to fix things in the scene graph renderer. This was just an example where by pure luck, it was actually, the result was actually useful to us and was helpful to us. Usually you need to understand the internals of the scene graph renderer um, 
if you're really at that point and the GPU rendering is slow and you've do done all the other things I've talked about, like making sure only the visible items are rendered, uh, optimizing your geometry to optimize the patching, like, in the, like the help patch says. Once you've done that, this is the last resort, but it usually is only useful if you know the scene graph renderer or if you have custom shader effect items or if you have written, oh, many people do that, they embed custom OpenGL items in their Qt quick scene, then of course this will be useful because these are then the OpenGL commands you actually issued. So in this example, yep, we were lucky and we figured out our shader effect was the problem. And I've got five more minutes. So let's talk a bit about API trace. Um, as I said, it runs on embedded. It's just a thin wrapper, LD preload wrapper around all OpenGL calls. It has a front end called QAPI trace, so it's written in Qt. Front end is QAPI trace, which is the visualization I've shown you there. Um, it's quite easy to build, so try to download that and uh, does it say, yeah, use API trace trace and then the command you would usually execute to start your application and it will intercept all OpenGL commands. Then you can later visualize that and it even works remotely on embedded devices. So that's quite a cool tool. So that is how you, to sum up, that was how you look at the rendering performance. First of all, most of the time it's not the actual rendering that is slow, but it is other aspects like slow threads or processes. You have lots of timers interrupting the scene. Um, have a look at other tools first bec before you have a look at the render time. And once you look at the render time, um, follow the tips in the Qt documentation. And if that even is so slow, then you can finally have a look at the actual rendering performance. And even that, as you've seen, is mainly C++ code you can break down further, like the update polish call we saw, like the update paint node call we saw. So much of the work in rendering, or, or if your scene is not, not fast, not smooth, not velvet, it's actually stuff happening in the CPU. If you, if you really analyzed all that, and only then, you noticed, yeah, it's really the GPU being slow, then break it down further, use tools like API trace to figure out what is wrong. Um, I do have some backup slides, uh, but it does not make sense to start a, uh, actually maybe. Yeah, I'll have one backup slide, a few more minutes. I'll talk about responsiveness, which is when you click a button, how long will your your eye take to react? I've got one slide about that. Um, usually it's quite similar to startup profiling actually. So when you click a button, it's most most of the time is an event handler in, in QML in JavaScript, like the on clicked handler in mouse area. So you start with the QML profiler, which will show you the JavaScript code being executed in the on clicked handler, which if the button takes a long time to react, is of course the start, or is the point where you need to start looking. Um, that said, mostly when you click a button and it's slow, is because the button triggers like a page view or screen transition, and you need to load other items. For example, this is a bit of trade-off between startup and responsiveness. If you add lots of loaders to your application, your startup will be fast, but of course, these loaders have to instantiate their object at some point, right? That is usually when you invoke, let's say you put your settings menu behind a loader, because there's no need to load the settings menu at startup. If you have put your settings menu behind a loader, of course, then if you click the settings button, yeah, it will take time to actually make the loader load these settings. So it's a trade-off between startup performance and responsiveness. But even then, you loaders help. Um, if your loading of settings is slow, try to load try to load less settings. So maybe your settings is divided into multiple pages and you can put each page behind the loader. But still responsiveness 
is very much the same as startup. You use the QML profiler, and you might use the C++ profiler to go into details. OK. That brings me to the end of the talk. I want you to remember two things. First of all, if doing things is slow, do less of them. Second thing is, know how your tools work. Understand what Qt Quick does, at least the high-level picture, because otherwise, like the four phases of creation, uh, of loading a QML file, where it's already completion phase, you wouldn't know how to interpret that result if you don't know what it means. So read the documentation of your tools, make sure you understand how they work, and then you're able to interpret their output. And of course, use as many different tools as possible. You've seen here we use two, uh, three different tools, and just using one tool is usually not, not good enough if you cross from one domain into the other. So use different tools, know how to use them, know how to interpret their results. Thank you. Just a short question. Um, in the logging of the scene graph, there was, um, um, it said, uh, breakdown, breakdown of render time. Yes. So that uh, means, uh, in the translation, it's, the breakdown comes only up if it's taking too long, so the uh, 60 FPS cannot be hold, or does it mean breakdown because it splits the timing into parts and just uh, means display? Yeah, yeah. Breakdown means it simply splits the Render time into into details. It always displays the breakdown of the render time. Uh, because um, we have this turned on, and I always read breakdown, breakdown of render time, and I thought, oh, something's really going wrong. No, but, no, uh, <laughs> not that. It was just the first try, and I ha yeah. have to read the uh, documentation. Yeah. As it's, said. it's just <laughs> splitting up the actual render time into more details, which you can understand if you know how the scene graph renderer works. A practical question: uh, When we need to change the whole scene? from uh, one view to another, basically mm -hmm. destroying a lot of objects, creating a lot of objects. This creates uh, obvious uh, performance penalty, which uh, f results in a real slow responsiveness. We visually see how the scene is being redrawn. Mm -hmm. Are there any ways to at least hide the effects uh, or optimize them out? So you have your transition to a view, and creating that view takes a lot of time. Is that uh, correct? Yes, between two different views. Yes. Um, again, Think about if all the things you have in the view are really necessary to really load at that point. Um, uh, actually, the destruction is uh, the slow part. The what? Destruction. When, we, uh, when uh, a oh. lot of objects uh, get shut down, you can visibly see how uh, that mm. they, they are slow. Yeah. Do we really yeah, need because to it's a complex scene. It's do complex you need scene. to destroy the scene, or can you keep that in memory? Uh, that's the question. Uh, yeah. w what is the advice to make user at least not see uh, any artifacts? Um, well, if you use a loader, for example, once the loader has loaded a component and doesn't unload it anymore, uh, unless you set the active property to false. Um, otherwise, well, if destruction takes a lot of time, have less items to destruct, or use a profiler to know why, why the destruction is so slow. I suspect you can't do much if you have long destruction times besides reducing the complexity or simply not destroying them. Well, um, in your case, actually, um, uh, what yeah. you can do is set the old scene to invisible and then uh, uh, destroy the objects with a timer iteratively oh, and yeah. set the other scene also before you create it to visible and then iteratively cre create the object and at some point switch them over. I'll have that in my talk, which is yeah. right afterwards. <laughs> right. Ulf's talk is right after this talk. He talks about the QML profiler, so I'm sure he has many interesting scenarios as well. So if you're interested more in performance, do attend his talk. Any other questions? You, you said that um, uh, when there's not animations uh, on, the, on the screen, uh, the FPS is zero. Yeah, well, so it, it won't do any retraws, so yeah. you can't measure anything if there's no, nothing going on. Okay, okay. And so uh, when there is 
uh, a small animation, for example, just an mm. icon, a, yeah. mo a movie icon or something like that, yeah. uh, are there ways to avoid of redrawing the whole, uh, the whole screen? Um, no, the way, or yes and no. So the way the Qt Quick 2 scene craft render works by design is that it completely redraws all of the scene. Like Qt Quick 1 had incremental updates because it used a raster engine. It was able to only redraw the items that actually have changed, but that's not the way OpenGL works. So it redraws everything. If you use the built-in animation classes, that tries to animate at 60 FPS. Uh, there are ways to control that, but usually the built-in animation classes animate at 60 FPS. If you want, like, have a blinking icon or whatever, uh, that you want to animate at a lower frequency, don't use the animation classes, but use a timer with a custom interval. Um, so are there any scenarios where it makes sense um, that if you have a complex scene that on QML side uh, you can uh, somehow render the complex scene into one placeholder in one frame buffer object or something? and yep. then use this from... Yeah, that's a very good point that I actually didn't mention. If rendering a complex scene is slow, uh, what the scene craft renderer supports is rendering the scene into a texture at once, then reusing the texture in later frames. Uh, if you look at the documentation, that's the item.layer property of a cute quick item. Read that documentation and then uh, it will show you how to do that. But it only works with um, C++ implemented uh, quick items, or is it? Uh, no, it works with any quick items. Oh, okay. Yeah. There are drawbacks on that approach. Um, read the documentation; it will tell you about the drawbacks and the advantages. Thank you.